not long ago. This was an abandoned field. But Srila Prabhupada He glanced upon it with a vision. A vision that someday thousands, hundreds and thousands, millions of people would be gathered here to be transformed by the mercy of these two brothers, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, who are supremely merciful. There is a very well-known story Srila Prabhupada was at a temple in America. The presiding deities were Nitai Gora Chandra. Instead of singing Radha Madhava, he sang this song by Lochandas Thakur. As he was glorifying the supreme mercy of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. He became choked up, unable to continue. Tears streamed from his eyes. The temple room was enveloped in complete silence. It appears that Srila Prabhupada was seeing and experiencing the mercy of Lord Nityananda right before his eyes as hundreds of young Americans who had no conception of God, who were addicted to all sorts of sinful acts, how they had been completely transformed. Srila Prabhupada never took credit for anything that he had done. One time he was asked, Swamiji, can you perform miracle? He said, I have made hippies into happies. That is my miracle. Miserable people, addicted to impious life, are now dedicating 24 hours a day in the loving service of the Lord. By such high standards, that the people of the West cannot even comprehend. People who are sleeping it all day are now waking up at four o'clock in the morning. No intoxication, no gambling, no meat eating, no illicit sex, chanting the holy names, some even giving up luxurious wealth 
to live in the simplest, most austere conditions, only to serve their spiritual master and Krishna. That transformation is a miracle. But Prabhupada saw himself only as the instrument, the puppet of the miraculous compassion of the previous acharyas. At the origin is Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. Today, we visited Godram Vip and Madhyam Vip at Surabi Kunj. We heard about how Lord Nityananda Prabhu opened his marketplace for distributing Krishna's holy names. And the only price he asked was our faith, our willingness to accept it. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, whose life and soul was simply to serve the mission of Lord Nityananda Prabhu, made his residence practically in the very same place. From there, he wrote literatures that were not only perfectly authorized by the Guru Parampara, but so creative and universal in substance that they could transform sincere and intelligent people's hearts from all over the world. He had a vision of spreading Mahaprabhu's mercy throughout the entire world with the same spirit that Lord Nityananda did in Godrumdvip. That spirit was, was fully imbibed by his most empowered son, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And on his first meeting with His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, he inspired that same spirit in him. And it is that mercy of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda that has been preserved in the hearts of those pure souls that is our only qualification. In Navadweep, Pundarik Vidyanid, he was visiting. But nobody knew who he was, except those who came from his native place of Chattagram. Lord Chaitanya, one day he went into a trance of ecstatic love and started crying out, Pundarik, Pundarik. That is the name of Krishna. First, the devotees were thinking he was chanting Krishna's names. But the way he was chanting, he was saying, my father. They understood he must be speaking about a great Vaishnav that must be coming to Navadweep. (laughs) 
Now Mukunda dot Vasudev dot Chaitanya Ballava. These devotees were from Chattagram. So they knew the greatness of Pundarik Vidyanidhi. One day Mukunda told Gadadhar Pandit that I know you are always eager to meet saintly people. who have surrendered their lives in the loving service of Lord Krishna. Please let me take you to see one. Gadadhar Pandit was very, very grateful for the opportunity. Until they came to the house of Pundarik Vidyanadhi. Gadadhar Pandit was a very simple, austere brahmachari. From his earliest childhood, he always worshipped Krishna with love and devotion. Very austere, always blissful, because he wanted nothing for himself. He wanted nothing in terms of prestige or honor. He wanted nothing in terms of material facilities. He was content just chanting and hearing the glories of the Lord and serving the Lord's devotees and absorbing himself in remembering Krishna. When he saw Pundarik Vedyanidhi, he was confused. What kind of Vaishnav is this? First of all, Pundarik, Pundarik Vidyanidhi was sitting on a very luxuriant, luxurious bed with silk pillows of various colors, silken sheets. And he was dressed with elegant garments wearing jewels and ornaments. His hair was finely combed with perfumed, scented oils. He had mascaras. He was chewing spices. There were nice brass pots all around him, holding different um, delicious things for him to chew and to eat. Every now and then, there was a high-quality mirror on the wall. He would look at the mirror and smile. <laughs> so happy with what he was seeing. Gadadhar Pandit, he didn't say anything. But he was thinking in his heart, why did Mukunda bring me here? How is this a great Vaishnav? But Mukunda knew exactly what Gadadhar Pandit was thinking. So he sang a particular verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. A verse that was chanted by Uddhava at the time when he was feeling deep separation from Krishna, who had already departed from the world. Remembering how Lord Krishna was attacked by the sister of Bakasura. Her name, Putana. She was also the sister of Agasura. Very empowered family. <laughs> she came with the intent to murder Krishna, cruelly, when he was only one or two days old with poison smeared on her breast. 
so devious. She disguised herself as a beautiful goddess. Krishna sucked her milk. He sucked the poison. He sucked out all of her anartas. Then he sucked her life. And for just that moment, at the time she was, after all the anartas, all the impurities of her heart were eradicated by Krishna. In her heart, there was a motherly affection for that little baby. Krishna only saw that. He magnified that and gave her eternal liberation in Goloka Vrindavan where she would be his motherly nurse in ecstatic love forever. Uddhava was crying out, who? Who could be more merciful than this? How could I worship anyone else? When Pundarik Vityanidhi heard that verse, how Krishna is most merciful even to the most wicked, the most cruel. Krishna loves all living beings. Everyone is his children. Ahambija Pratapita. Putana had already killed innumerable babies. Viciously. She deserved kalpas in hell for what she had done even before she came to Krishna. And now, with so much hatred and envy in her heart, she wanted to kill the Lord. But somehow or other, Krishna just magnified that little inclination that grew within her heart of motherly affection for him. He put her through a suffering, an intense, concentrated suffering by which all the anartas were removed quickly. Patita Bhavana, the deliverer of the most fallen. Why would Krishna forgive a demoness like that? Why not give her the justice she deserved? Why Goloka Vrindavan? Because Krishna sees different than we see. In this world, justice is necessary, especially to protect the innocent. But ultimately, every soul is pure. Every soul loves Krishna. Every soul is loved by Krishna. It's just all these coverings which are built upon the false ego that create abominable, obnoxious, obnoxious mentality, words, and actions. Krishna forgave her in a moment and gave her ultimate liberation. Now every devotee considers themselves very fallen. That is a contradiction. But in real spiritual life, there are so many apparent contradictions. But they are all resolved when we go deep into the essence of the love between God and the soul. How every devotee thinks themselves so fallen so unworthy. Just a few days ago, we were discussing the Mahaprakash Lila in Srivasangam. These are the greatest devotees that ever 
walked upon this earth. These are devotees who are eternal residents of the spiritual world who descended with the Lord. Why are they feeling themselves sinful, fallen, no love of God? Haridas Thakur saying, I'm abominable. Anyone who even comes near me becomes contaminated. He's thinking like that. It's just a natural quality because that quality opens the heart completely to receive the Lord's mercy. So Pundarik Vedyanidhi was such a humble soul, feeling himself so fallen. And when he heard how Krishna gave elevation to Goloka, to Putana, he became ecstatic. So much hope. There's hope, there's hope for Putana, there's hope for everyone, is there not? if we somehow or other just connect ourselves to Krishna. He started weeping, torrents of tears. He lost total control, just immersing himself in the forgiveness and the mercy of God. He started rolling around. His hair became completely disheveled. In his rolling around, all his clothes got ripped to shreds. The nice pillows flew in all directions. The pots flew in all directions. Ten men tried to hold him down, but they could not. And ultimately, he just came to such a peak of ecstatic love that he fell unconscious and laid there motionless practically lifeless for nine hours. Hare Krishna. Meanwhile, Gadadhar was thinking, Mukunda saved my life. I was thinking negatively about this great Vaishnav. But Mukunda saved me by revealing his real greatness. And he expressed to Mukunda Dutt that I, I should atone for my offense by accepting him as my eternal master and taking initiation from him. Hare Krishna. When Pundarik Vidyanedi came back to his consciousness, he looked around and everything was everywhere. And he realized what he had just done and he became very embarrassed. And then he greeted Gadadhar Pandit <laughs> once again. <laughs> and his desire was expressed to him. Gadadhar Pandit went to Lord Chaitanya and expressed to him his thoughts. And Lord Chaitanya was so happy. He said, yes. He is my own father. There is no one with devotion like Pundarik Vidyanidhi. So on an auspicious day, there was initiation. So Patita Pavana, the Lord is merciful even to the most fallen, inconceivably merciful beyond the realm of the dualities of this material nature. Mercy sometimes just doesn't concede to the principles of justice. The laws of karma are all about justice. You get what you deserve. 
the laws of the state are a, supposed to be about justice. And for human society to run properly, there must be kings who are protecting justice. But the nature of the Lord and the saintly persons is sometimes they intervene. That is the conclusion of Gita. Sarva dharman purityajya mam ekam sharanam braja aham tvam sarva papi vyo moksha yishami masucha. Abandon all varieties of religion, Krishna says, just surrender to me and I will deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. That is Krishna's power. No one else has that power but God. But in these two brothers, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, they have exhibited mercy, forgiveness to fallen souls way beyond even the realm of Krishna. And there are many examples. In fact, many are here tonight. <laughs> but the classic example that our Acharya's cite is the deliverance of Jagai and Madhai. Parama karuna pahundui jana nithai gorachan. the deliverance of Putana and sending her back to the spiritual world. That type of mercy was not adequate to deliver the people of Kali Yuga. The Lord had to go way beyond that. One day in the house of Srivas, Lord Chaitanya in front of all the other devotees, he gave an order to Lord Nityananda and Thakur Haridas. He said, listen, listen carefully, Nityananda Prabhu, and hear what I say, Haridas. You go throughout the towns and the villages. Everyone you meet Everywhere you meet them, you give this one message. Chant the names of Krishna. Worship Krishna. Become Krishna's devotee. Krishna is your mother. Krishna is your father. Krishna is the treasure of your life. Do not consider who is fit, who is unfit. Do not consider a person's caste, a person's education, a person's past, a person's present. Whoever you meet, everywhere, go to the marketplaces, go to the houses, go to the bathing cots. Wherever you see any human being, give them this message. And at the end of the day, come back here and give me a comprehensive report of your activities. Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas Thakur went out into the streets. If we really meditate on what they did, it has to transform our lives completely. Here is Lord Balaram and Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma happens to be the most powerful of all the demigods, the father of every living being in the universe. 
No demon can even touch him. Such an exalted position. He's the original spiritual master within the universe. And Lord Balaram, who's the guru of all gurus, who's non-different than Krishna. He's Krishna's elder brother. Who's the source of Aniruddha, Juma, Shankarchan, and Vasudev? Who's the source of Narayan? The source of Ram, Narasimha, and everybody. The source of all the three Vishnus, including Mahavishnu, whose inhalations and exhalations create and annihilate the entire cosmic manifestation. That is Balaram. the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Nowhere have we seen the Lord taking such a merciful position as Nityananda Prabhu. He becomes the servant of every living being. He's going to insignificant, envious, rascal little jivatmas. And he's the source of Paramatma. And he's approaching them with folded hands, offering them all respect and honor, and then begging them to chant the holy names of Krishna. Lochandas Thakur, he writes, that if they refused, he would get on his knees and beg them. If they still refused, he would prostrate himself at their feet and roll in front of them and weep and cry and beg them to take the name of Krishna. All day, every day, this was their activity. Pious people, just seeing the beauty and the love in the heart of Lord Nityananda, what could they do but take a vow to chant the holy names every day, give up all sinful activities forever, and worship Krishna? <coughs> but not all people were like that. Some of the people that Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas Thakur approached were angry as fire. You're speaking, worship Krishna. What you're t who are you to tell me what I'm supposed to do? There were caste Brahmins. Shri Mayapur Dham Ki So nice. <coughs> Cast Brahmins, they're thinking, I know the Shastras. I perform my rituals. I have so many students, so many disciples. Who are you? An unknown Avadut. Who are you to tell me what to do? Get out from here! 
audacious, egoistic fool, get out from here. That is how Nityananda was treated. Now you all know the story of Romaharshan Sutta? He was a mild um, version of these Brahmins. And Balaram took one piece of grass and one piece of grass, he cracked the heart of Romaharshan and he fell dead. But Nityananda Prabhu, when those puffed up, arrogant, envious, violent, tempered demons abused him, he took that grass in his teeth, he fell at their feet and begged them, please take the name of Krishna. And they didn't. They just chased him away. Others, they were spreading nasty, horrible rumors about Haridas Thakur and Nityananda Prabhu. Don't let them come near your house. We know who they really are. They're informants for dacoits. They go to your house in the name of begging you to chant. They're looking inside and sizing up exactly where you keep your valuables, where your windows are, where your doors are, and then they tell the dacoits and then they'll come and rob you. Don't let them near you. This is the kind of rumors. Now Lord Brahma, Lord Balaram, <laughs> they would, they're not like us. We're, you know, we're helpless at the hands of these cruel, arrogant people. But they accepted the humble position and rolled on the ground, begging them to take the names of Krishna. And many, many surrender their lives by the influence of Nityananda Prabhu and Hari, um, Haridas Thakur, and others simply blasphemed them and rejected them. But Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas, they were ecstatic. Because they were not dependent on the results. They were pleasing Lord Chaitanya by following his instruction. That was their ecstasy. And they deeply cared for these people. Lord Nityananda Prabhu came to the conclusion that for them to the only possibility of these people to be delivered is if they take shelter of Lord Chaitanya. So everywhere he went, he was trying to induce people to chant the names of Goranga. You all know that song? Vaja Goranga, Kaho Goranga, Laho Goranga Namre. Jejana Gorango Baje Se Take the name of Goranga. Worship Goranga. Speak and hear about Goranga. If you do this, you become my life and soul. This was Nityananda Prabhu's spirit. Anyone who would take the name of Lord Chaitanya would become his life and soul. He would embrace them. He would touch their feet. He would garland them. He would put sandalwood pulp on every limb of their bodies. He would weep and cry and, and thank them profusely. You are my life and soul. That was his mercy. One day, Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas, they heard very harsh language. They came closer. They saw a crowd of people, very fearful, keeping a long distance from these two demons. They had huge, powerful bodies. 
Sometimes in our ISKCON temples, we have dramas of Jagai and Madai. And it's usually like a comedy. <laughs> Jagai's, wah, Jagai, oh, Madai. Like and everyone's laughing like that. But even more because they're better than act actors than me. But that's not the way it was with the real Jagai and Madai. Nobody laughed at them. They were serious, violent criminals. They were huge bodies, powerful bodies. In their previous lives, they were Hiranyakashipu, Hiranyaksha, Ravana, Kumbhakarna, Shishupal, Dantavakra. With all the powers, they were Jagai and Madhai. Did anyone laugh at Hiranyakashipu? <laughs> Not in his presence. Nobody laughed at Jagai and Madhai in their presence either. They were so intoxicated with strong liquors. They were just making a scene, howling obscenities. They could not speak a sentence without a forbidden, vulgar curse word in it. They were demons. And seeing how everyone was so afraid of them, Nityananda Prabhu asked one of the people, who are they? They said, the whole town of Navadweep fears them. They were born in Brahmin families. For generations, their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents were very, very highly qualified, pure-hearted Brahmins. But these two brothers, due to bad association from the beginning of their lives in childhood, have become demoniac, addicted to every type of sinful activity. So much so that their parents, their families, and the whole society totally rejected them. What do they do? They're always drunk. They kill Brahmins. They personally, with their own hands, they kill and eat cows and drink their blood. They rape women. They rob houses. They set houses and villages on fire. And because they're so nasty and so powerful, even the government can do nothing to stop them. There are so many court cases against them. But no police officer will dare to serve the papers to them. They'll be killed in a minute. Obviously, Jagai and Madhai were not just two drunks off the street. They were powerful. They had tantric powers. <laughs> 